Okay, thank you for joining us today for the Crisscross Virtual Challenge webinar series. Human Kinetics is happy to be one of the sponsors of this innovative and exciting virtual challenge, and I know you're going to enjoy this webinar series. But you're not here to listen to me, so let me turn it over to Jan Seeley, co-director of the Christie Clinic Illinois Marathon Race Weekend and creator of the Crisscross Virtual Challenge. Well, great. Thank you, Sue. Good to see uh, those of you who are maybe watching it live, as well as many, many people who will watch it after today. Um, as Sue said, I'm Jan Seeley. Um, I am locally known as the marathon lady at the grocery store. When people see me, that's what they call me, uh, which is, um, it is what it is. I'm happy with that. Um, before we get to um, our guests, uh, TJ and Patrick, and get to our, our, our topic of conversation today, which is the Prairie State Fun Facts and Figures, um, I wanted to take an opportunity to just uh, uh, talk briefly about the Christie Clinic Illinois Marathon, which is why we even have a crisscross virtual challenge. Um, those of you who are in our family already know that um, while we opened registration for our 2021 race, uh, we went ahead and paused it at the end of September um, as the ongoing pandemic continues to um, kind of just lay waste to not just uh, industries all over, but especially the running uh, endurance industry. And as we grew less confident that we would be able to put on a race um, of our scale, upwards of 20,000 people um, in late April, um, we had to put the brakes on it. Everyone is kind of frozen in place. And so um, we're, we are still paused. Uh, we do hope to speak with the university um, after the Big Ten football season to explore um, more likely the possibility of a fall date. I think um, as this goes on, those of us uh, realize that large events are probably still um, more of a Q, Q3 2021 event, but maybe we can we can do something in the fall. So we really kind of lost our connection with all of you, and we wanted to have a way to engage um, with you to uh, keep connecting uh, and also to lend some purpose and motivation for your own training. I know I'm a runner of over 40 years. I'm still out running and walking uh, most days, and and so the idea of doing something that would bring us all together and motivate us is, is sort of where we started. And we were lucky that our, our um, registration partner, Race Roster, has developed this interactive uh, results leaderboard that allows you to integrate a mapping feature. Um, and so knowing that we could do something virtual that would allow people to come and post their results and connect that way with a real map um, that is rate Google enabled, it, it's sort of that was the germ for the idea. And um, as I thought about Illinois, that we're not just here where we live, but elsewhere, people aren't really traveling that much. It seemed like a perfect opportunity to celebrate our state. Um, and while we have participants from all over the world and nearly every state in the United States every year, a large percentage of our, our participants historically live in the state of Illinois. So that gave me the idea of trying to do something to celebrate the state. And so that's how the Crisscross Virtual Challenge was born. The Crisscross is virtually the intersection of the north to south route with the east to west, Champaign-Urbana being that intersection point. We always want to keep you guys mindful of, of the mothership here here in Champaign-Urbana where the Christie Clinic Illinois Marathon Race Weekend takes place. Um, but then to kind of kick it up a notch, we wanted to add some educational pieces. And that's where the guidebooks, and we're going to look at those a little bit. We have a guidebook um, that is uh, for the north to south route as well as the west to east. Um, and then these, um, these webinars to uh, bring more attention to not just information about our state, but but topics in and outside of running as well. So this is the first of nine webinars that we're going to do over the course of, of the crisscross. Um, so with that said, I want to introduce um, our two guests today. I wanna just put a timer on this because I wanna keep track of our time. So let me get that started. Um, I want to introduce our two guests today. I'm very excited to have both of these very, very, very busy people with us. Um, TJ Blakeman um, is, uh, oh gosh, I was gonna say the guy with the beard, but they both have beards. So uh, TJ, if you can raise your hand up again, there we go. Okay, TJ Blakeman um, is the president of the Board of Trustees of the Champaign County Museum, History Museum, a position that he has held since 2015 when the museum was on the brink of closing and elevating TJ to that position is really what kind of saved the museum. Um, and over the past five years, TJ and the board have completely revived the museum uh, with a renovation of its home, which I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know until I read TJ's bio that is in the historic Cattle Bank 
on University Avenue right here. I drive by that all the time. I never knew. Um, so not only does the museum have a new home, but all new professional exhibits and programs and TJ's goal for the museum and the future includes securing funding streams, cataloging over 200,000 objects in the museum care um, and implementing new systems that ensure that the museum will have uh, success long beyond uh, TJ's career. Professionally, TJ is a, a certified planner, and he has been a staff member on the City of Champaign, um, excuse me, uh, City Planning and Development Department for 17 years, and he is the senior planner for economic development. So he is the person who helps bring new um, economic things to Champaign-Urbana. He, I'm the official marathon lady. TJ is known as the official historian, unofficial historian for the city of Champaign. So all things Champaign are in that man's head. Um, personally, TJ was uh, raised in a small Western farm community called Ashland, which is actually uh, a little bit uh, north of our west to east route and a little bit east of, of, of Jacksonville, right? TJ, if I take 123 off of 72, does that bring me right up to Ashland? That takes you right there. Yeah, about 10 minutes it drive. Does. That's great. I, I kind of spied that last night. And um, TJ is a U of I grad, um, and he and his wife Katie have three young daughters. So I know that you are a busy person, as as you are with, with Katie. Um, and I also wanted to introduce Patrick Kane. Um, Patrick grew up in Rantoul. Yes, the other bearded guy. Patrick Grant grew up in Rantoul, but he lives in Champaign now. He is the public um, programs and visitor services coordinator for a second museum that I didn't know existed. It's called the Museum of the Grand Prairie, and it's located in Muhammad. Um, the museum has been around since 1968, um, and its mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural and natural of Champaign County and East Central Illinois. Pat is a Illinois State grad and congratulations you're almost done finishing your master's degree in history uh, at the same university and I thought this was an interesting fact prior to working at the museum Pat was actually a history and social studies teacher in the town of Riverton which is on our west to east route in fact it is the first town that will be in part two of our west to east guidebook we left off at Springfield Riverton is the very next town um, no. so, what'd you say Go Hawks, that's, that's the mascot of the high school. Got it, got it. Um, and somehow, despite being from Central Illinois, uh, Pat is a diehard Vikings fan, a Minnesota Vikings fan. Go Vikes. Okay, I know you're not the only one in town here. So, so let's dive right in. I thought it would be fun because I do want to make sure um, that everybody knows about your museums. And again, I, I'm pleading ignorance here because I didn't know um, that I could visit both of them. And we want to make sure that I have a laundry list of places I'm going once I can move freely about the country and Illinois is where I'm starting and I'm going to go to your museums. So I thought we could start, Patrick, with you first. Tell us um, one of the coolest, fascinating artifacts or things that is in uh, the Museum of the Grand Prairie for us to know about. Um, yeah, uh, Jan, uh, thanks for for having having me on today. The opportunity to you know talk about you know one of my one of my passions, local history, and you know spread spread the word of the museum as far as possible. Um, uh, good to be with you all uh, today. Um, well, at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, uh, one thing uh, I, I wanted to share um, recently in in March of this year, uh, we unveiled uh, a new exhibit on March seventh. Uh, titled How Long Must Women Wait? Women's Suffrage and Women's Rights in Champaign County. Uh, it's a special exhibit for this year uh, that we unveiled, uh, and I'm uh, really, really excited about it, and it turned out really, really great. Um, unfortunately, um, on March 13th, you know, much like museums and other institutions, you know, we had to close our doors to the public. Um, uh, but uh, the exhibit explores um, uh, the 19th Amendment's uh, impact locally uh, mm -hmm. since 2020 is the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment's ratification, which actually Illinois was the first state to ratify the 19th Amendment. Nice little uh, Illinois fun fact, too. But we uh, put this exhibit on uh, to commemorate this historic anniversary. Um, you know, we're also in an election year this year, had a big election take place uh, about a month ago. Um, and the exhibit explores uh, the pre woman suffrage movement. Um, uh, the height of the suffrage movement uh, nationally, as well as what was taking place locally with local suffragists and uh, local movements. Um, and then, of course, the ratification of the 19th Amendment um, in 1920. And then uh, after effects, 
uh, of the 19th Amendment leading up to pretty close to current times where we talk about uh, 20th and 21st century women's rights um, uh, related issues. And one big focus of the exhibit is that, you know, uh, women's rights and rights for marginalized groups um, in this country throughout our history um, is an ongoing struggle. Um, you know, the, the fight certainly isn't over. Uh, I, I don't believe that there, there ever is a finish line, you know, if we're talking in race terms, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, since we're with runners. Uh, I don't think there's a finish line for some of these struggles. And it just reminds us, you know, to keep on going. Uh, keep on fighting uh, for what we believe in, and uh, this exhibit does a really good job of that. Now, unfortunately, um, you know, Jan, you mentioned that you wanted to get out and visit, you know, some places. We did have to close the museum, um, much like museums across the state of Illinois uh, uh, with tier three mitigations that recently came out, but uh, we're looking to reopen in the near future uh, once it's safe to do so, but we're doing a lot of uh, things online. Um, a lot of virtual content on our social media pages and websites, uh, including virtual tours of exhibits, including a virtual tour of the exhibit I just mentioned, which is on our Facebook and YouTube page for you to explore from the comfort of wherever you can get an internet connection, really. Um, That's so. fabulous. We'll, we will, when we do our post e, um, webinar email to everybody, make sure to include that. Where exactly in Muhammad is it located, Patrick? Um, so the museum, uh, we're a part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, seeing that we're located right inside of Lake of the Woods Forest Preserve there in Muhammad. Um, we're located just off of Route 47, just north of I-74 um, in Muhammad. Um, so, you know, we're located right in the middle of this forest preserve. So when we do reopen to the public, it's a really awesome way. You know, a lot of people make a day out of it. Uh, come out, check us out inside, and then go walk on the hiking trails or check out the botanical garden behind us. Yeah, I was just running on the trails there Saturday, so I could have could have thrown a rock through your window, I think. So. There you go, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. That sounds like a fascinating and very, very timely and timeless exhibit. So, um, TJ, how about you? Well, first of all, Jan, thank you so much for having me. I think this is a terrific event. I think it, just the idea of crisscrossing the state and highlighting um, little towns across the state is really near and dear to my heart since I grew up in a small town of mm -hmm. 1,200 people in west central Illinois. So I've spent my entire life along your east-west corridor, and so <laughs> I'm excited cool. to be able to broaden outside of Champaign County, which I don't often get a chance to do and talk about the history of the rest of our state. But um, as you mentioned, I'm the president of the Champaign County History Museum. We're a tiny little museum starting in the early 1970s and 1972. Um, we are located in the Cattle Bank. It's the oldest commercial building in Champaign County. So we have a little tiny space, but we make a lot out of it. And so we have a ton of, of uh, momentum behind us since we've turned the museum around and we're excited to welcome people back in our doors once again, hopefully mm -hmm. very soon. But um, like Patrick, the, the like the Museum of Grand Prairie, we have a lot of resources online. We would certainly encourage people to go and check those out, champaigncountyhistory.org. We have our, our speaker series videos. We've got stories and um, lots of local history that you can find there, even while we're closed. But um, when we open, we'll open with some new exhibits as well. Unfortunately, some of our current exhibits got cut short, of course, because we had to close. But um, mm -hmm. you asked the question, what is one of the more interesting items in our collection? You know, I think that's a really tough question. We get to ask that all the time. One of the things I love, one of the items I love in our collection is our not quite full complete collection of Illinois Marathon medals. Oh, I think wow. it's important to- What are you um, missing? I have to, we'll talk off you know, we'll talk here. afterward. You know, I think what's important about museums is we oftentimes think of them as stodgy old places that just collect mm -hmm. old Victorian era things, but we collect things today. Our job, our mission moving forward is to tell the story of the people of our city, county, region, uh, state, and nation. And the only way to do that is to accurately collect things that are happening now. And so we've really been trying to put more of a focus on that. And, and the Illinois Marathon is one of those pivotal moments that when it came about, it put such a focus in bringing thousands and thousands of people mm -hmm. to our community from all across the world. Uh, just like the University of Illinois brings people from around the world. So how can we not look at that event as being a critical piece in telling the story of Champaign County? So um, we're we're very pleased. We're, we're missing all of you, um, all of you runners out there. We're missing having you here in our community, and we want you to come back and see us very soon. We love it here in Champaign County. We know if you haven't been with us before that you'll love it as well. So thanks for having us. I look forward to chatting about local history, but also state and regional history.
You bet. Well, thank you for uh, saying what you said about the Christie Clinic Illinois Marathon. You know, I think that it has um, shown a brightest, one of the brightest lights on our incredible community. We know how great it is here, but something about the race weekend has really brought attention in a way that not even the university, not to knock Lovey and football and the university, which is a obviously incredible um, worldwide known uh, university, but it has brought people here to see how kind we are and welcoming and, and friendly. And, and, and I hear this all over the country as Mike and I travel around to other events to promote ours. It's like, your people are so nice. It's unbelievable. And, and you know, my, my family's from the Boston area and, and my, my my brother Tom comes every year and runs and he said, you you people are so damn nice. I can't stand it, you know? And so it's, it's, it's a compliment, but, but it's funny as well. So well, Jean, I don't think you should underestimate the effect it has on the community when even non race weekends, I remember very distinctly when the marathon started, um, the number of people that we saw out and about in the community running year long to prepare for that. I think it's really had a tremendous impact on the health of our community. Uh, because I think that it's, that has instilled this sense of running in our community that I don't think existed before the marathon. And I think you see it. Uh, I just there ha there was a noticeable difference in the years right after it, it launched and it's never changed. And you still see a lot of runners in this community. And I think it's it's changing lives, not only here in our community, but across the state. And, and yeah, I, I agree. And changing lives was certainly something that we did. Well, let's start talking about the state. Um, you know, I've just learned so much about a state I've lived in for over 30 years, just in the past, you know, two months. But um, so, you know, we are uh, the state of Illinois, just by way of a little bit of background for folks out there, because you might not know this, we are the sixth most populous state in the U.S. We only recently slipped to six from fifth Pennsylvania is now ahead of us, but we have, um, as of the 2019 numbers, of um, you know, 12.67 million people live here. Um, despite the fact that they're, they're one of the most populous states, we're only 25th on the list in terms of geographic size. So we pack a lot of people. Now I know Chicago is pretty dense, but but uh, we're 25th on the list. Um, our square footage or square miles is almost 58 thousand square miles and we put almost 13 million people in it and i know you know we have a lot of farmland but uh i thought that was interesting i, I knew we always had a lot of people here so but let's let's go back and talk a little bit about about our birth story like right? we all want to know where we came from and and so let's start with the what we can share about what we know about you know when illinois sort of came into consciousness when people arrived here when did we become a state um let, let's start there well, I, I don't want to, I'll, I'll jump on a little bit and Patrick, you yeah, jump yeah. in too. I mean, this, the story of Illinois goes way, way, way back. Um, you know, I think we have to realize we have a world heritage site in Southern Illinois in Cahokia, Cahokia Mounds. You know, there were people living, uh, Cahokia, this, the town of the city, I, the village of Cahokia back in the day was a thriving um, city um, in Southern Illinois where all of the, natives in the region, you know, would have known that and transacted business. It was a huge uh, central peak point. And today, you know, you can still go visit Cahokia Mounds, but it's just the mound that was in the kind of the center of that town. But I think it's important to realize, especially in Southern Illinois, our state developed from the South to the North for the most. I think a lot of people look to Chicago and think, well, that must be where Illinois story started. It was at the, the mouth of the or at the at the Great Lakes and the Illinois River or the Chicago River. No, that's not the case at all. It it started way down in southern Illinois, uh, the, along the Ohio, the Wabash and Mississippi River uh, basins, and the population moved north and it moved west. Um, you know, the French Illinois is a French word um, that the French influence around St. Louis and Point South was really strong. Um, it wasn't until after the Revolutionary War and the Illinois Territory was formed and, and after the British, you know, the British, once they were gone, then, then, Amer then the United States started to move westward through the Illinois Territory. But um, our story, a lot of people don't realize it starts from the south and moves north. Really interesting. Um, Patrick, tell us when Illinois became a state. Yeah, Illinois... Um became a state in 1818, 21st state admitted to the union. Um, and, you know, as TJ was mentioning, uh, you know, the, the, the state really started farther south um, uh, with 
uh, fur traders, the fur trade being a big reason, you know, a big economic and um, a, a trade uh, item um, commodity that uh, Native Americans, uh, uh, French and English uh, were trading with each other, you know, along these different river basins in this area. And eventually with, you know, with the fur trade bringing uh, poor, uh, populations, um, uh, European, pop European populations uh, farther west, you know, we saw that uh, the Illinois Territory was put into place just after uh, the turn of the uh, 19th century. And then we eventually see uh, Illinois becoming the 21st state, as I mentioned, in 1818. Mm -hmm. and, and Patrick, um, TJ, something you told me was that um, back then anyways, when we didn't have 50 stars on our flag, that the additional stars were added every July 4th. So we became um, a state in 1818, but our star was added to the U.S. flag, I understand, in 1819. Yeah, that's right, Everett, and that's, that's a fun fact. I'm sure some people know, some people don't, that the, the stars get added to the flag the, pre, the following 4th of July. That's always customary when the new star is added. Of course, we haven't had a star added since the 1950s, um, but Illinois, yeah, our star would have become um, on the 21 star flag in 1919. Got it. And and um, the pronunciation of our state is kind of an, a joke for us here, right? When we sing uh, the Illinois fight song, we always want to add the S. And, and when it's kind of a, a little bit of a litmus test for any, I can't remember which football coach it was that when he um, did his first press conference, he mispronounced the name. We're all like, oh, no. I think Ron Zook might have done that. Was it Ron Zook? I think you're right. You're I don't right. know. I could be wrong. I shouldn't, get, yeah. I shouldn't blame Ron. But uh, it's, it's the influence of the French. Is that why the S is silent? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, of course, Illinois is, the, you know, this this idea that most of the tribal groups, there was the um, Illini tribe. Uh, these were not really formal groups, but groupings of different Native Americans. And there certainly were uh, many that occupied the land around Champaign here in, in East Central Illinois. But, you know, there was larger settlements around Peoria and kind of along the Illinois River, uh, along the Wabash River. These were the places where you could navigate to across Illinois by river. You know, East Central Illinois, where we're at here in Champaign County, was one of the last areas in the state to be settled. Um, our county wasn't founded until 1833 which is pretty late to the game in terms of county development across the state. And that's because before the advent of trains, most people considered East Central Illinois prairie wasteland, this mucky, thick mud that could just, you couldn't get through it. And so if you couldn't traverse the state by waterway or some established road um, by horse, then you couldn't get to it. And so it wasn't until the trains pushed through Really, I mean, early settlers were starting to push into the county, um, but but draining the land, draining this beautiful historic swamp, which we are the prairie state, but there's very, very, very little of that prairie still remaining. But if you were to go, if you were to go back to 1833 in Champaign County, you'd be standing in in you know eight foot tall prairie grass with thick muck um, abound, and you, you'd have a hard time getting through it. So unfortunately, we don't have much of that prairie anymore. It's been drained. And um, and so today we have corn and soybeans that replace the, the massive amounts of prairie that used to stretch, the great prairie that used to stretch across most of the state. Right. I, I read somewhere that 80% of Illinois is now farmland. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, that uh, the implementation of of drainage tile um, uh, in East Central Illinois, you know, here in Champaign County was a, a huge, huge deal. Um, at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, we have a collection of uh, uh, oral histories um, uh, from East Frisians, uh, which is um, an area of Germany that these immigrants uh, came over and settled in a part of Northeastern Champaign County, uh, small towns such as Gifford, Flatville, um, uh, just outside of Rantoul, uh, closer to where I'm from. Um, and they talked about the implementation of this drainage tile, uh, you know, to get rid of this muddy, swampy land like TJ was talking about, uh, mm -hmm. to make it a little more arable for farmland, uh, which Illinois is so, so uh, known for. Um, and TJ talked about, you know, the county's history and, you know, the, the implementation of the railroad. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see just the huge impact that the railroad had on communities, you know, much like ours here in Champaign County, 
uh, on the population. We have at the museum, we have this graph that shows census records um, on display in one of our exhibits, and it shows the 1850 census um, in Champaign County. We had just under 2,700 2, people. And then over the course of that decade, um, in 1850 to 1860, uh, with the uh, uh, development of the railroad here in Champaign County, the population almost um, increased by five times to just under 15,000. And then again, uh, with uh, the census in 1870, th that population doubled uh, to close to uh, 33,000 people. So the railroad is a huge, huge part of our history, you know, much like a number of other things like TJ was mentioning, you know, um, uh, with Native Americans, you know, we talked about the S uh, being silent in Illinois, that French, uh, that French origin. Illinois, um, uh, that LaSalle was a French explorer in, in uh, Northern Illinois that named the Illinois River, Illinois, because of the people that he met on the banks of those rivers, um, you know, the Illiniwick, the Illinois people, or as they referred to as themselves, the Anaka people. Um, uh, so meeting those Native Americans, you know, it's, it's really important to understand where we come from because that's what gave us the name for our state today. And these, you know, these peoples um, who were here long before uh, European Americans you know, have a huge, huge impact on our state's history. As TJ was mentioning, you know, the Cahokia of Southern Illinois, uh, there's the Potawatomi uh, of, of, of Illinois, there's the Kickapoo, there's a number of others uh, that have a huge, huge impact and a huge, huge piece of Illinois history that, uh, that we have to remember. Yeah, and, and it, for those of you who have dug into the, the guidebook, you in the Star of Rocks, we did a special couple pages just on that and uh, the how the, the Star of Rock got its name ties back to the, to the Potawatomi that you mentioned. Um, and just for the record, because I know we have, part, I was telling you guys yesterday, we have participants from over 30 states already and, and, and two countries. Um, we know to say that, that Illinois is pronounced Illinois, but for the record, people, it's Illinois, like annoy at the end. Um, right. and, and so people who live in the state are Illinoisans. Illinoisans, sure. Illinoisans. It looks like there's different spellings. Um, I want to just touch back on two, one thing and then go forward. Just about the train, the piece that you just talked so passionately about, Patrick. Uh, one thing that we've noticed in our work, um, certainly um, on the west to east route, is how the arrival of the train and also on the north to south route really changed communities and and in some places towns actually moved in close so they would be by the tracks where they were originally platted changed when the trains came basically in you know in the middle of the 19th century so that's cool i want to tie back to the point you made earlier patrick about how in some ways the population uh not some ways for sure grew from the north uh, from the south of the state up to the north. To, so one of you guys walk us through what happened with the state capitol, because it's in Springfield now, but it wasn't originally. What's that story? Well, I think that it's a story of the people as they moved. As the state got larger and moved further north, it got further and further away. You know, um, People were moving further and further north, and they wanted the state capitol to always try to be more central to the state itself. And so, mm -hmm. um, so that's what happened over time. You know, it didn't stay in Vandalia too long before finally they moved it to Springfield, which Springfield is pretty much, you know, pretty close to geographically the center of the state, especially with what we said about East Central Illinois not being as populous in those days. Um, so Springfield seemed to make a good spot. I'm sure there was lots of political jockeying uh, for, um, this would have been right around the time Abraham Lincoln was in the legislature as well, uh, when that decision was made to move the capital to Springfield. Mm -hmm. um, there's always politics behind those kinds of decisions of where the capital is going to be moved, but um, I'm sure there's some. There's been movements even since Springfield to try and move the capital to Chicago and and uh, other locations, but ultimately, you know, the capital was built in the 1870s. Uh, the current capital was built in the mm -hmm. 1870s and the 1880s, and um, you know, Springfield is is now our state capital. Right, and it sounded like the decision was made in 1837, and then the, the physical building moved happened a couple of years later. Yeah. So, well, to, to wrap up this um, sort of state birth origin portion of our of our webinar, could each of you guys talk about just a few historical events that you think really stand out for you as historians of our state? Patrick, maybe start with you. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, some of them we've already talked about. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, Illinois, there, there are some specific, um, you know, things that happened here in Illinois that I think are really huge to our history. But I think we're not too far 
uh, different from, you know, some other Midwestern states and, you know, how some of these major historical events, uh, you know, throughout the country, throughout the Midwest affected us. You know, I mentioned the fur trade um, helped bring, you know, larger populations of people here uh, to eventually uh, allow us um, uh, to become a state. Um, I think the, the the sad and tragic removal of Native Americans from the state by way of disease or conflict is another huge piece. The movement of the capital uh, is something that I had in my notes. Um, I think the development of agriculture and agricultural technology, um, including John Deere's steer plow and Cyrus McCormick's uh, mechanical reaper, uh, you know, being that, you know, you mentioned, Jan, earlier that 80% of Illinois' land is, is farmland. It's such a big piece of central Illinois. Um, uh, that development of agriculture and agricultural technology was, was a huge, huge impact. Uh, the development of the railroad, as we already mentioned, uh, you know, Chicago becoming such a huge player um, on the global stage, I think is a huge piece. Uh, again, the development of the canal, railroad, and eventually the national interstate system, you know, for cars uh, and transport, I think was huge. You know, um, I think you mentioned earlier, Jan, about how these towns formed around these railroad stops. I think if we look at you know, almost all these towns that are on, uh, you know, these north, these north, south, or east, west uh, routes in in the guidebook for the crisscross challenge. If you look at almost all of those towns, uh, I, I I would uh, I don't know about I don't know the history about all of them, but I'm uh, really eager to read that guidebook to learn more about them. But I would take a fair guess to say that those towns were established either because they were close to some sort of waterway. Um, they were a stop on a railroad system or even later on, you know, became a stop on an interstate system or there was some sort of development of industry, whether it's commercial industry or um, here in Champaign-Urbana, you know, a huge impact on our community, of course, is the creation of the state university system. You know, we have the University of Illinois here in Urbana-Champaign. So those would be some major developments, I think, in the states. Great. Uh, my, how about you? Well, those are that's a terrific list to start with right there. I mean, there's no <laughs> doubt, though, that Illinois has been an influential state in national politics. I, we're home to four presidents, birthplace to only one. That would be mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan. The rest were imports. Abraham Lincoln from Kentucky and Indiana, Ulysses S. Grant um, and Barack Obama. But, um, you know, one of the things we've been working on at the museum, and I was going to try to weave it in here because I think it's really important, is we were, we have an exhibit coming on the Illinois traction system. This was an electrified. Uh, Patrick talked so much about um, how important transportation is to the development of the state. I think that's very true, and I think that uh, especially in Illinois, that's very true. But one of these systems, and, and being a, a child of the east-west route here, um, one of these things that I think is so fascinating was the development uh, in the early 1900s of William McKinley, he's from Champaign, William B. McKinley from Champaign, um, was an entrepreneur who started an electrified railway system that linked almost every one of the towns, many of the towns along your east-west route. Um, to, it bound us together in a time when we couldn't get across the state. I think his, uh, his innovations were tremendous. I think that's a really interesting story. And I think if most towns, especially in central and east central Illinois look and even down to St. Louis look into their history they'll find that that's a really great piece of local history these trains would take you we, you could hop on on a streetcar it looked like a, a giant Pullman car if you will in the middle of the street in downtown Champaign and you could find yourself in St. Louis or wow. in downtown Peoria or downtown Springfield or Hayworth or Riverton or any other small little town in between it opened um, what was a very closed world to hundreds of thousands of people to bring their goods to market, to travel themselves. And it really opened up people's visions of what our communities were here in central Illinois. So I think that's a really fun little history yeah. story as well. Yeah. What, what's related, up? To that, yeah. related to that, uh, TJ brought up the traction system. Uh, the the County Forest Preserve District here in Champaign County, um, one of our uh, forest preserves, we call our forest preserve, is actually uh, the Kickapoo Rail Trail, which is decommissioned railway uh, that is now a multi-purpose trail for runners, um, uh, walkers, cyclists, you know, all, all, all kinds of travelers along that trail. And Run it, on it, all the time. <laughs> yeah, it follows the path, uh, the, you know, the former path of uh, where the Illinois traction system was going. So. It's, it could be a good opportunity to get in some miles for the crisscross challenge while thinking about, you know, people could have in their minds that they're running on history. 
uh, mm -hmm. while they're trying to complete some miles for the challenge. Yeah, I have to keep re telling people, you, you don't need to travel to South Beloit to run on the crisscross. You're doing all your running and walking where you live. Um, but let's uh, let's take a quick pop over if I can do the technology here and, and look at, at one of the guides. I, I want to do the um, let's see here. Show my screen. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, I'm going to do the north south. There we go. Uh, let me make this a little bit smaller here. Um, I I, I want to tie this to um, the the railroad thing. So here's the this is part one of the north south guide. It covers the towns of South Beloit. Um, to uh, just before Bloomington Normal. And I want to look at the town of, Ka let's see. Um, oh, you know what? I'm on the wrong route. Well, anyways, this is the, we'll just take a quick peek here. Each little town or city has its own little profile and um, you can see where on the route uh, it, it, that town is located um, and where we could get pictures. We've included those. Uh, and as I said, we've done, um, the first half of each guide. Let me see if I can switch over to the east to west guide quickly. And while you're doing that, I just want to say this is a really great tool. I mean, I think that I think that too often we overlook all of our small towns. Now we're coming, we're becoming such an urban um, populace that we and and coming from that small town, we overlook them a lot. And this is a great tool to envision yourself running along this track and and technology like Google Earth can bring you down these communities. I hope you'll take a few minutes to to be curious and explore, you know, drop down a street view in the middle of some of these towns and just look around because these small towns across Illinois are just wonderful places full of hospitality, uh, full of their own history. And this really shines a light on them. And I think you've done a terrific job, Jan, to do that. Well, I, I want to thank um, two people um, um, that have helped with the guides. Taylor Bauer over with Jane DeLuce's staff at Visit Champaign County. He initially reached out to um, all of the state tourism bureaus to see if we could get a little bit of a head start on information. We built out a template um, of information that we ideally could get about each one, and, and that was really gave us a good start. But really, my, my, my partner in crime on this is a wonderful woman from Oswego named Tina Heydrich. And uh, Tina and her family are part of our Christie Clinic Illinois Marathon family. Family, and that's how I know them. And turns out that she is a museum manager up in Oswego and we just hit it off. And, and so the two of us have been working on this, but I wanted to show you, but I, I want to move on to talk a little bit about topography. And then we're going to do some sort of fun facts about Illinois, but like one of the towns on the west to east, it's almost to um, the halfway point is the town of Kappa. And that name was given because it was, and I, I don't know my Greek stuff and I've forgotten it already, but Kappa means something in Greek. Is it 11, eight? What is it? Nine? Whatever it is, it was this, it was a reference to the where on the railroad stop it was, and that's how it got its name. Um, so well, you know, many of the towns along the Illinois Central Line, especially, they all took the exact same form. It was a formula that they applied. All the streets were exactly the same. The street layouts were exactly the same. And so many of the towns that you see on this list, they all have the same configuration. And many of the times, you know, we used to have a alpha, beta uh delta mm -hmm. street uh before they were actually given names it was just all part of this formula uh mm -hmm. and so that's a really kind of neat uh backstory to how so many of these small towns all developed because the railroad but they all have the same street names as well yeah well getting back to what you said about the street view so on that leaderboard on that interactive leaderboard that that race roster has built for us you can drop the little orange character um that's on the map feature that is the street view guy so if you see where you are anywhere along that route you drop you just actually use your mouse and grab it and you drop them down and um all of a sudden you're in a cornfield or a cemetery or on the road and you can rotate it around and so to, to tj's point it would be really a fun thing so let's talk briefly about the topography of the state because it is so different we we think that well i don't know some people don't leave town but it is not flat everywhere in the state of illinois so what's the backstory on why our top i mean i feel like illinois a little bit like california the, the geography and the culture is so varied from north to south and east to west it could be five town it could be five um different states and that reminds me to say that illinois is bordered by five states we're, we're not the state that has the most um, other states boring us, but we do have five. So it's quite varied. TJ, talk a little bit about that. Well, I think the biggest driver of our topography is ice. 
believe it or not. I mean, during the last ice age, it goes all the way back then. You know, these huge sheets of ice were, were coming down from Canada, uh, and they ended right here in central Illinois. They, their advancement stopped. And so that's why across north, uh, northeast Illinois, central Illinois, east central Illinois, you get this very flat. And that's why you got all this mucky um, ground. It was all just leveled off mm -hmm. and there was nowhere for the melting water to go. It just kind of sat there. It became these prairies. But what it didn't get to, what it didn't shear off were the areas along the Illinois River and Southern Illinois, like Shawnee National Forest and the Illinois River Basin with its huge bluffs and the Mississippi River Valley with its um, hills and its rollingness. If you go up to Galena, you know, it, it's just this beautiful rolling uh, countryside. And so it, it really varies all across Illinois, but it really comes down to the fact that the ice as it barreled through these massive sheets and i i don't know patrick maybe you know how thick they were at their kind of uh, highest point but these huge sheets of ice just pushed all of this dirt along and just smoothed it all out which is why we have a relative oh, so flat. flat land that we live on here in central illinois I mean, we we are well known as a great place to qualify for the Boston Marathon because of our flatness. Yes. Uh, yeah. But um, you know, it's not like that uh, other places. Um, Patrick, what would you add to that? Yeah, uh, you, you know, ice ice is a is a huge huge influence, as TJ mentioned, you know, with the glaciers and these sheets of ice, you know, carving out the landscape. It's also, I think, a fun fact to mention. You know, it's um, uh, there were some large, you know, along with the glaciers and the ice age. There were some large megafauna or large mammals uh, that used to inhabit this area, such as woolly mammoths, mastodons, uh, saber-toothed cats, giant sloths. So wow. just imagine that um, in the landscape, along with those sheets of ice that carved out this flat landscape. But um, at the museum, we have a section of one of our exhibits called Built by Fire and Ice. Where we have a glacier. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we also talk about how the prairie landscape um, adapted to natural fires taking place. Um, you know, when a thunderstorm or a lightning strike would hit the prairie, you know, some of these prairie plants would be very, very dry and could catch fire very easily. But uh, like nature, you know, like everything in nature, it adapts to its surroundings and the plants actually um, got used to the fire and it's actually good for the plants still where there's some natural prairie or um, some restored prairie for them to actually be set on fire because it actually opens up uh, uh, the soil, gets rid of maybe some plants that uh, are, are hogging all of the soil from some of the native plants and paves the way for these plants to regrow. And it's actually a good thing uh, for, the, for the prairie to catch fire. Um, uh, and it's something that the County Forest Preserve District that we do uh, periodically in different areas um, uh, to you know, get that uh, prairie plant regrowth in the restored prairies that we have. And, yeah, I noticed that on Saturday when I was running on the trails, there was a couple of areas of where there had been controlled burns. Um, I was running in the, in the forest preserve there. Um, yeah. Jan, can yeah, I add a little something? Uh, if we get down to the micro level here in Champaign County, for all the yeah. runners who have run the Illinois Marathon, uh, they know that when you get over by the Champaign Country Club, you all of a sudden are kind of met with a hill that's kind of late yeah. in the course. And we get, think, oh yeah, we get grief about that. So I think one of the interesting facts about Champaign-Urbana, Champaign County, is we actually sit on two watersheds, two major watersheds. If it a raindrop that falls on the west side of Champaign ultimately finds its way to the Illinois River and the Mississippi. But a raindrop that falls on the university at Memorial Stadium mm -hmm. finds its way to the Wabash and the Ohio River. And that divide is that hill that all of your runners have to wow. climb. Uh, it doesn't look like it's much, but there is actually about 30 feet of elevation difference between uh, the city building in downtown and the top of that hill around the uh, country club. I know some of the runners probably know what hill I'm talking about. So that is a really fun fact. Yeah, we are flat, but we're not quite that flat. Yeah, um, I I, um, I, ran, I had a participant from our race this year who deferred to next year, but his daughter goes to school here and he decided as long as he was coming to pick her up for Thanksgiving, he would do the marathon while he was here. And I'm, I love to be in cahoots with participants on that. And so um, I helped 
kind of coordinate that a little bit for him. And then I went and I ran the last six miles with him. I, he was booking. I really had to run fast. But uh, you come up that hill, uh, Armory is the street, um, yeah. at mile 23 on a normal Tuesday. It's not a big deal. But when it comes at mile 23, you notice it a little bit. But, but that, you know, that's a good segue. Uh, this has been so much fun. I want to end with some fun facts. And I, I want to tell you about a fun fact I learned. Um, Illinois is the home of Twinkies. They were they were discovered. They were made here uh, in 1930. So I went ahead. This is I, I could go hurtling back to my childhood here. Hold on a second here. Uh, in April of 1930, Twinkies um, were discovered. Were made. Yep. I really wish I could have dropped dropped some Twinkies by you guys today, but um, it's not bad. Not bad. Whoa! I got nine other ones. So I'll, I'll find you guys later. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> so Twinkies, one of the fun facts about the state of Illinois, let us quickly kind of rapid fire if we can go over some other fun facts. Um, all right, let's see here. Um, how, how about if you each give us one? Well, uh, it's actually in your guide, but I knew this before by living over there. Jacksonville, okay. Illinois was home to the Eli uh, Ferris Wheel Company and Ferris Wheel and the Scrambler. That was that's a great fun fact. Were created in Jacksonville, Illinois. OK, that's right. Patrick. Um, I, you know, we can't I, I can't talk about Illinois and not talk about Abe Lincoln, um, but uh, especially Abe Lincoln locally, you know, Abe Lincoln, uh, you know, of course, before he became the 16th president of the United States of America, was a, a lawyer practicing law for about two decades on the 8th Judicial Circuit, which goes around um, in central Illinois, uh, going through, you know, maybe some of these towns on these on these crisscross challenge routes. But uh, not, a fun fact, especially locally here for Champaign County, is uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln was the court appointed uh, defense lawyer for the first ever murder trial tried in Champaign County. Wow. I also read that he was the first postmaster in New Salem, Illinois. He was. Yeah. And it's weird because there's a, the Barry, the Barry there's a New Salem. There's a New Salem on the route and then there's an Illinois, then there's an Abe Lincoln New Salem. They're not the same at all. They're not the same. No, New Salem is New Salem is close to my hometown in Petersburg, Illinois. The Abe Lincoln's New Salem. You can still visit there. It's a state uh it's a state park. You can go in. They've rebuilt a lot of the log cabins. You can visit the Barry Lincoln store where he had his little general store. But this is where Abraham Lincoln lived prior to his law days uh and living in Springfield. He right. he came this was his first uh, him and his family's first home uh in illinois got it um tj what's the oldest town in illinois oh gosh i do you know this i think it's cahokia Co isn't it it's, i think it's cahokia yeah I, I think that's a fair guess i'm not sure honestly it's somewhere in southern illinois it's gotta be okay all right we'll we'll say that um that's okay that's okay um i learned that the lincoln park zoo uh, is the oldest zoo in the country. That's very cool. I'm sure a lot of us have, have been to that Lincoln Park Great zoo. Yeah. 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 Um, let's see. I read, is it true that the, that the state capital was not, was not just in Vandalia before it was, was there another town as well? I, I believe the first one was in Kaskaskia, uh, <laughs> since it had such a major influence when it was just the Illinois territory prior to it officially becoming a state. Yeah, it was only there. Like I think Kaskia, fun fact about Kas Kaskia. First of all, I don't think hardly anybody lives there. It it, it flooded, um, and and now the town's basically gone. But it is technically on the western side of the Mississippi River. The course of the Mississippi changed, and it split this section off. So there actually is a portion of Illinois west of the Mississippi, and it's the little former town of Kaskaskia, Illinois. There you go. Okay. Yeah, I think when the capital is there, right? like a reproduction of the Liberty Bell, I think is still there as well. Yeah. I think okay. I think I think when the Capitol was there, the Capitol building was nothing more than just like a almost like a two story house structure. But then of course as TJ mentioned, it was it was wiped away with the with the Mississippi moving. Patrick, tell us something we might not know about the state of Illinois. A fact. Um, well, uh, when I was teaching, uh, I used to teach U.S. government and civics, and one of the requirements for that class uh, wasn't just U.S. government and civics, but we had to take the Constitution test, the U.S. Constitution and the Illinois Constitution test. And I used to always quiz my kids on these, like, really, like, 
boring, like they, they don't mean a thing state facts for Illinois. You know, we have, you know, state, the state mammal is the white tailed deer. The state fish is the bluegill. Our state song is Illinois is the name of the state song. But I guess just recently within the past decade or so, we have a new state snack and a new state pie that I think, but they, it's not just a random state snack and it's not just a random state pie. They go along with, you know, Illinois, our state snack is popcorn, you know, being that we're, uh, you know, agricultural hub, uh, you know, with corn, our state snack is popcorn. But do you want to take a guess at what our state pie is? TJ? Pumpkin pie, pumpkin pie. yeah, because uh, ah. Morton, Morton is the uh, pumpkin capital of the world over uh, a little bit farther east from us, closer to Peoria. Yes, the same 85%. The of the Illinois Basin make great growing for melons and pumpkins. And Libby's, who makes all of your canned pumpkin pie, their, their largest factory, I believe it's their largest factory, is located there in Morton. And they just roll the semis full of pumpkins in, and out comes your can of pumpkin goodness. It is the pumpkin capital of the world, and 85% of all pumpkins can come from Morton. Unfortunately, it's not on our road, but you know what? We're celebrating all of it. Um, and just if you're curious, the state fossil is the Tully monster. I just love that one. That's okay. a great one. Well, you know, we, we could go on for days and days. This has been just so much fun, but I, I do want to be mindful of your time um, and um, all of our viewers. Um, I want to end with, um, I had my, my Twinkie treat, but I have another treat for everybody. Um, you probably already know about it if you've gotten the information about the webinar, but um, our great sponsor, Human Kinetics, and again, I want to thank them and, and Sue for being our uh, behind the scenes technician today. They have an incredible offer for all of our crisscross participants. Um, it's their best discount of the year and its timing is perfect um, from today which is december 8th through december 21st you can get 40 percent off the great running books that human kinetics has as well uh, as their sports conditioning books stretching sports nutrition they've got everything that you can find you don't have to be a runner to uh, enjoy what they offer um, you're going to use a special promo code uh, crisscross one and again don't worry about writing any of this down we'll put it in the email you use that at checkout to get your 40% off. And, and best yet, if you order by December 16th, you're going to get free shipping. And this is an important thing because there may be people that are watching this webinar in January. And unfortunately, you will have missed the free shipping. But, you know, HK is a great uh, website to go to. Uh, I used to work there. There's a lot of friends there. Um, so, uh, as I said, we will send you that information when you go to the shipping thing. If you can order before the 16th, you're going to pick the holiday promotion shipping option. Um, and while you're visiting the HK website, make sure that you sign up if you'd like to receive uh, their monthly endurance running newsletter so you can stay apprised of all of the uh, like kind of new breaking things from Human Kinetics. Um, and I do want to help you just a little bit with your shopping. This is kind of the Carol Merrill uh, product placement part of our webinar. We've got two books that uh, Sue's going to show us that uh, might be of interest to those of you out there. The first one's called The Happy Runner. If we got that, uh, oh, she's going to hold it up. I'm it's called actually going to hold it up. <laughs> yeah, there we go. The Happy Runner. I love this. Um, learn how to run fast, long, and stay healthy with proven training methods. Understand and adapt your running based on your personal lifestyle and goals to avoid injury. And develop your belief and make positivity your default setting so that you can reach your goals. That just, uh, I'm definitely getting that one. And then the second book we wanted to recommend is a very, um, one of HK's most uh, top selling book is called Running Anatomy. Uh, it's a best selling guide that delivers exercises, insight, and illustrations to show you how to increase muscle strength, optimize efficiency in your running motion, and minimize your risk of injury. Um, well, again, I want to thank uh, Patrick and, and TJ so much. This is, like I said, we could have gone on forever. Um, I want to thank everybody who listened to us live today. Um, we hope you enjoyed it, and those of you who are watching it back later, um, those of you who have uh, signed up, um, you'll get a little exit survey from Sue coming, if you can give us some feedback uh, about the webinar, ideas for future ones, um, which leads me to say that there will be future webinars. Our next one is going to be Tuesday, January 8th, um, excuse me, January 12th. There'll be every other week starting January 12th, and um, knowing that you know, it's pretty easy now for us to get out and run and walk and do our miles. But when you get to January and it's dark and cold, it gets to be a little bit more challenging. So we've titled this um, upcoming webinar, Don't Let January Break Your Stride. Keep stepping safely this winter. We'll have a couple of um, guests, including a surprise guest, and we'll get those and we'll announce those to you as we get closer. So till then, from everybody 
at the Christie Clinic Illinois Marathon race team. Uh, we want to wish everybody a safe and happy holiday. Again, TJ, Patrick, Sue, thank you so much. And uh, take care, everyone, because uh, I got to go eat some more Twinkies. <laughs> Thanks, See everyone. Bye-bye.